Uh, all right. Uh, hi. Good, good. Good evening. How are you? I I see there's um there's only two people in the room. I'm not sure what that means, but uh, I suppose we can start. Uh, seeing as it's a Friday. Uh, okay. I don't know if people need a reminder from class. I mean, a reminder in the WhatsApp group that uh, class has started, but uh, maybe I should do that. Let me just try and see if I can. Okay, so I, I suppose I'll, I'll just start by uh, by asking if, if people have specific questions. Well, oh, I see Judith, you're the only one present. Okay, this is just the two of us. Um, Do you get a chance to look at the to review the stuff we we discussed yesterday and day before yesterday? Do you have any specific questions, concerns, or something? Uh, yes, I, I did. Okay, I think we. I'm still lagging behind on the institutional repository. Okay. Yes. Uh, the other content about the library, digital libraries, I think I got it. The main okay. objectives were the preservations, creation, mm -hmm. story. Right. Yes. Right. But I think on the institutional repository, yeah. I think I'm too a bit behind. Which 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 part about these different repositories is um, is confusing for you? Uh, the content. Where we were talking about the user services. Yeah. Oh, if we could just mute our microphones, maybe. Uh, okay, thanks. Yeah, so we we're talking about the user services. Yes, yes. Hmm. Okay, so for those of us just, who just joined us, I was, um, I was asking the people in the room um, if they had any specific questions related to the content that we've covered so far. And uh, Judith was just, uh, was just uh, telling me that. Uh, um, the part where we introduced digital libraries was pretty much okay, but uh, there's aspects of where we talked about the system repository that are still a bit, um, a bit vague, I suppose. Um, so just, just to mention, uh, really, that uh, it turns out that um, very, very soon, uh, at some point, actually, at some point we get to would we'll probably get to touch more on institutional repositories, so maybe that will make a bit of sense. And then also, we have uh, two people so far that are going to come through to talk about um, institutional repositories uh, in real-world settings. So the talk by the Zika's librarian, for instance, um, and the talk by the um, the head of the public relations at, at, at UNSA, who also happens to be the current acting institutional repository manager, uh, are all going to be centered around the institutional repository. So hopefully, uh, by the time we are done with that, you should be able to maybe pick up or maybe some aspects that are still um, a bit vague should be should be much clearer once they, they give their talks. Um, but fundamentally, if, if the best way to think of institutional repositories is to be just a specialized type of digital libraries. Right? They're, they're, and they're specialized in that they are used in a specific domain um, and they're used to archive or to store specific types of digital objects. And specifically, we're making reference to things like scholarly research output. Right now, now I know. I mean, there's, there's bound to be debates about. Uh, oh, what about uh, you know these open these so-called open access journals that are 
popping up all over the place, right? Um, the thing that sets institutional repositories apart from when you compare them with, with platforms such as uh, these, these open access journals is the fact that um, while, while these open access journals will typically be used to, to preserve over a long period of time to preserve um, uh, peer review, typical peer review journals, what institutional repositories would do is they're used to archive everything that's generated by, by these, these institutions, right? So preprints, postprints, uh, books, book chapters. In certain instances, like the, the case of the Investor of Cape Town, um, they, they've taken a more radical approach where if you look at their homepage, right? Um, I'm just going to open up the homepage. If you look at their homepage, what you immediately notice is that um, what you immediately notice is that they store preprints, postprints, electronic thesis and dissertations, and also OERs, right? Open education resources. Right? This is this is highly unconventional. In most, in some institutions, what what they will do is they will typically have separate repositories for for storing OERs. Right, so you have uh, so-called uh, learning object repositories that are typically used to house this. Um, and in fact, for institutions that are well-resourced uh, in terms of manpower, for instance, like institutions that typically have uh, uh, system librarians that are employed to look after these systems, what they will do is they'll have a separate repository dedicated to electronic thesis and dissertations. So this, this is, is highly unusual, what you're seeing here. And the classic example, I think, I don't know if I still remember this, but uh, uh, it is the uh, Penn State University does that as well. Um, Penn State University has a separate repository for ETDs. Right? Now there's, there's, there's different ways of looking at uh, the pros and cons of doing this. Uh, for starters, I mean, separation of concerns is usually a good idea, right? So separating content that is generated by students, for instance, is usually a good idea. Uh, separating it from the content that is produced by faculty staff. I mean, if you look at UNSA, for instance, there's, um, there's, uh, there's this whole debate about the quality of uh, these manuscripts that are produced by uh, electronic. University. Uh, I don't know if it's Penn State University or if it's something else, but uh, it should be, maybe not. Um, so what you notice is they, they have, there we go. So this is like a, a separate portal, right, um, for Penn State. And in fact, what some institutions will do is they'll go a step further, right? Um, so institutions like uh, my alma mater, for instance, UCT, there's a whole range of so-called subject repositories. So different uh, schools or faculties within the university have come up with their own standalone repositories, but these repositories are synchronized with the main repository. So for instance, the Department of Computer Science has uh, this document archive, right? Uh, so in here you will find, um, you will find uh, ETDs, for instance, you will find uh, preprints, you will find postprints, right? Um, but also besides this, um, I my master's dissertation is there. Yeah, so there you go. So you, you, you notice that accessing this subject repository that's specific to the Department of Computer Science allows me access to my, to my PhD thesis. But at the same time, if I go to the institution-wide repository, I will find my thesis, right? right? And, and, and really synchronizing this information is really not that hard. Uh, I think there's a bit of echo coming in from Matilda, just need to have a quick look. Um, I don't know if it was Matilda, probably. But so synchronizing this information is not that hard, actually. This is the same reason why, if you look at, um, and we talk about this, I uh, hope today, but if you look at the way, uh, the way the pipeline that's associated to all these different moving passes, different subject repositories, institutional repositories, is the way they're set up is they're set up in such a way that um, you, you can literally synchronize this information all the way up to the national level, right? And by national level, I mean you uh, coming up with something like this, netd.ac.za. Uh, and I think it's www, host name is wrong. 
right? So if you search, if you search in here, you also you will find the same ETDs that you find in that subject repository in the institution wide repository. Uh, so you see this, just zoom in. Um, and we talk more about this after our discussion of uh, protocols, by the way. So you notice that this, this thesis here is the same thesis that you find in the subject repository. It's the same, it's the same digital object that you also find in the institution-wide repository. And interestingly enough, it's it's also the same thing that hopefully you should be able to find. Uh, here's to hoping this is going to be there. If I say, uh, NDLTD. Uh, hopefully you should be able to find in the LTD. Should be able to find my manuscript uh, volunteers. Uh, probably not union catalog. I think well, that's, uh, that's a bummer. Uh, ideally, oh, this is browse, I think it's browse. He is on different. Let me see if we can find it here. <clears throat> um, oh, it's search, not browse. Right, so hopefully within here, so this is the global uh, ETD portal, right? You see here, I find this, this same object, right? I find it in this globe. And, and the, the reason why you're able to find, or I'm able to find all these different objects is because um, at some point, at some point, information that is, the way this works is, um, uh, if I can find a page, a nice page, there we go. At some point, there's, there's, a, there's the subject repository, right? Yes, there's a subject repository. I guess I should start it at the bottom. So you have the subject repository. The way it's supposed to work is you have the subject repository, right? Um, and then using this subject repository, you can push information to the to the main IR, right? To the main institutional repository, the same type of digital object. And typically, what you're pushing up up above is is usually not 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 the complete digital object, but just the metadata, right? Um, and then this can further be pushed onto the national national ETD port, right? National ETD port, in the case of South Africa, that is. So you have the, and I'm, I'm wasting time drawing these things here. I wonder if, oh, why didn't I just, uh, why don't I just do it the, the nicer way, I guess. Uh, sorry about that. Okay, uh, so what I mean is, um, okay. So what I mean is that um, uh, horrible way of doing this, but so you you'd have uh, you'd have uh, you'd have an the a subject repository right now. This subject repository could be anything. Yes. Yeah. So in the case of UCT, for instance, here yeah, you have that computer science uh, document archive, right? So that pubs pubs at CS. Right now, this pub that CS can be set up in such a way that it synchronizes content to the main institution repository. In this case, this is the UCT IR, IR at UCT, and then and then this main this main IR at UCT can then be used to synchronize content moving up to the the main, uh, the national ETD portal, right? So this would be NETD at uh, RISA or something. I'm not sure if this, this is making sense here. And in fact, this is this this is the proposal. This is the kind of setup that that is advocated by the so-called. Uh, in uh, Network Digital Library of Thesis and Dissertation Consortium, right? So this organization, they, 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 they recommend that you use this sort of approach, right? 
And then the, main, the, the national ETD portal for South Africa can perhaps fuse into a continental one, right? We have data, data D or something, right, at Africa. Um, and then this data D here will be able to feed information into, into the, the, the global portal, right? In this case, the global portal is, uh, is actually the NDOTD portal. In the OTD portal, right? So much says that what you have is a situation where information that is generated by a unit at a particular institution can be propagated all the way up to this global portal, which, which sort of like stores descriptive information about ETDs from around the world. And if you think about this really for a second, you realize that there's various advantages linked to this, right? Advantages in terms of, uh, uh, I guess consist consistency in the data that is being fed up here, right? If I'm making sense here. Uh, so, if 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 someone from UCT produces uh, a dissertation, it only has to be uploaded into one repository in here, and then from here it will be propagated where it will be propagated from here. This is a subject repository. It will be propagated to the institution-wide repository from the institution-wide repository to be propagated up to the national portal. And this national portal for South Africa, you notice it has ETDs from all, at least most of the universities. See this list here, right? So information is periodically crawled or like periodically harvested from the different universities. Right? And it's easy really to do this. And then using this national ETD portal, you propagate information to the continent or to the regional portal. Now, I don't know if data D is still data D repository. Is it data R or data D? I don't know. Repository. No. Data D. Data. Oof. Uh, is it data R repository? Africa. I don't know. Hmm. Oh, it's data R. Okay. Let me see if I can find um, if I can find the data data R. I don't know who comes up with these names, right? That data R, whatever that means. Uh, data R, Africa or something. And this is so sad. And you find that most universities will actually talk about this, right? So most university libraries talk about this. Let me see if we can find it. It's usually down most of the case. I wonder if we can find the link. If only we can find, oh, I didn't know Zambia is appearing here. I wonder what this is all about. But uh, this is probably a horrible link we just pulled here. It's not pointing to the, I want us to go to the actual repository, hope to be able to find it. How about here? Uh, this is very strange. Why is there no link database? Ah, uh, Africa region. ETD portal. All I'm looking for is the, it shouldn't, it shouldn't really be that hard to find the data D uh, portal. Database for African pieces and dissertation. All I'm looking for is the link really, and none of these things seem to, oh, no, this is, is this the one? It has, I think it has a, no, it's not. It has a dedicated, uh, I don't know if people have come across this. It has a dedicated, whoever is mining it is probably not doing a good job because Ideally, when you search for something, data DR repository. Maybe it's here, I don't know. Oh, I think someone maybe has a, an answer here. I thought I had that, no, okay. This is, this is very strange. I'm 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 surprised that uh, that uh, are repository repository Africa. I want us to see if we can search through uh, 
see what this is all about. But I want us to see if we can search through. Yeah, this is horrible. Whoever is mining the repository is clearly not doing a good job. Uh, ideally, if this thing is properly indexed, this is even, uh, yeah, not here. Okay, this is uh, this is quite sad. I I don't know if anyone in the in the um, in the meeting attending the meeting has heard of the. Oh, it appears it's it's actually a correct link we were accessing. Then the portal is just down. I guess I don't know. This is quite sad. Uh, so it's it's dead. Okay. It's dead. Okay. It's not uncommon for such things to just die occasionally, especially if there are not people that are explicitly paid to do this. That's fine. Uh, but if you do have time later on, I guess when you when you check when you check this, you should be able to um, you should be able to access the content at your own time. Um, you probably want to check it out and see if it's going to work. It's going to share this. So the, the idea really is that um, so from from a from a departmental repository, you push information to the institution-wide repository. And then the information in the institution-wide repository is pushed to a national portal, right, which collects ETD metadata from universities throughout the country. And then the content is pushed up to a regional portal. And then content in the regional portal is pushed up to like a global portal, right? That way you have a sort of situation where uh, if there's something wrong with uh, an ETD, if there's something wrong with metadata, right, you just change it once here, and then the changes will be pro propagated all the way up there. I don't know if this is making sense. Uh, so, but before we continue, I don't know if people have uh, specific questions with uh, additional questions besides uh, Judith's question with regards to um, what we covered uh, yesterday. We did quite a bit. Uh, although our focus was really just on, uh, we're looking at fundamental concepts, but we focused our attention on uh, metadata and so-called unique identifiers. I don't know if people have specific questions to do with these two aspects we looked at yesterday. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, the takeaway point here is things to do with uh, the different types of, of metadata. Right? I've, 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 uh, I've uploaded a very nice, um, a very nice resource. There's a very nice resource on the Astria side. Uh, I do encourage you to go through that if you if if you wish to familiarize yourself with the three broad categories of metadata, right? As proposed by Riley. Um, so this whole notion of stru structural metadata, administrative metadata, and descriptive metadata. There's some really useful resource that you might want to to read through here. It's it's a short read. Uh, so this uh, thing by Riley here. Just paste it in the link as well. But the same resource is in the, I do believe it's in the modules as well. Uh, I don't know if this is making sense. And by the way, very, very soon, I'll also talk about uh, some of the initiatives, what we're thinking about. We, we have been thinking about uh, setting up a national portal for Zambia, right? Where ETD is from all the, yes, it's coming, all the 60 universities, right? I always like talking about this. According to HEA, right? Uh, we have a total of 60 universities in Zambia. So the plan, something that's in the pipeline for us is we want to make sure that, oh, it's, it's 60 years. We want to make sure that each of these 60 universities are able to synchronize, or we are able to harvest ETD metadata coming in from all the 53 universities, right? At the very least, at least the seven uh, public universities, right? So it's not enough to just uh, hear Unilas graduating students want to look at the, the work that they're generating. And it turns out that there's, in most instances, the work that is done by postgraduate students is, is, is so useful that uh, it needs to be fed to these important entities like uh, not-for-profit organizations and, 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 and government departments so that they feed into policy implementation or something. Okay, so if, if there are no questions, then we proceed, I guess. Um, we continue our discussion of metadata and then we start our, 
So uh, just a quick walkthrough of so-called Dublin Core Metadata Scheme. So that we get an appreciation of uh, why there's a big fuss about Dublin Core, right? So fundamentally, um, the, the real power of Dublin Core stems from the fact that um, it's made up of um, a limited set of elements that are repeatable and optional, right? And I hope there's an explanation for why it's repeatable and optional. No, there's no explanation. Uh, so using these 15 elements, right? These are the 15 elements here. Using these 15 elements, you can comprehensively describe a digital object by repeating the elements or leaving out some of the elements. And if you think about this for a second, you realize that it makes sense, right? It makes sense because Dublin Core is a generic metadata scheme. Because it's generic, you can use it to uh, provide descriptive information for um, heritage artifacts, descriptive information for scholarly research output, descriptive information for video content, descriptive information for um, sound content, right? Um, and in fact, you can even go a step further by highlighting the fact that you might be interested in providing descriptive information that is specific to a certain domain. Right? And so because it's, it's generic in nature, the power, the real power in Dublin Core is because it stems from the fact that the elements are repeatable and optional. Right? And, and I think the examples that I'm going to give here, but if you pause for a little while, you, you will appreciate this by, uh, uh, by just thinking about this particular slide, for instance. You will notice that there are two advisor fields to dc.contributor.advisor fields. And it makes sense because Lighton was supervised by two people, right? So for us to be able to tag this ETD to signal the fact that Lighton was supervised by these two people, we repeat, right? We repeat this element. Yeah. Um, and if you, if you are to compare it with what we have here, what we're repeating is the contributor element here. Even better, as you're tagging information with uh, details such as uh, subjects, for instance, um, you immediately realize that when you're ascribing subjects to, to a digital object, it's highly likely that you might want to tag it with more than one subject. And so using Dublin Core, it becomes very easy because all you do is you repeat, you repeat the subject element, right? Um, in the event that uh, the coverage or the relation is not important, in the case of EDD met metadata, for instance, what you do is you just omit the elements, right? And you can omit them because Dublin Core, uh, Dublin Core elements are optional. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's so funny because um, you can choose not to use any of the elements actually. But at, at the very least, I think when you're tagging information, at the very least, maybe you would want to provide uh, uh, perhaps a title associated with that object and, and maybe a bit of descriptive, descriptive text, right? Um, which is an abstract in the case of square research output. I don't know if this is making sense. So uh, the elements, all the 15 elements are both repeatable and optional, right? Um, and in fact, if you go to uh, a repository like the UNSA repository, for instance, and we, we just look at some sample. Um, we look at some sample, some sample digital objects or digital object. We look at just sample digital object, maybe latest submission. This looks interesting, linguistic analysis. If we look at the, the, the complete list of metadata elements, you immediately notice that uh, there are hopefully some things that I'm missing here. Let's start with the repeatable elements, subjects, right? Is repeatable. Uh, what else is there? I'm trying to see. I, I do believe uh, your URL is, should, should be one of those things that is generally repeatable. Uh, and this is a bad example because the UNSA repository is not integrated with um, a handle server or a DOI server, right? But, um, if you are looking at a repository like uh, the UCT repository, for instance, what you typically have is 
duplicate or more than one identifier tag. Why? Because one of the identifiers perhaps will point to will point to the local URI. The other identifier will point to um, will generally point to the the, UR, the the URL that provides global uniqueness, right? So if you've integrated with a, with a handle server, for instance, it would be the sdl.handle.net and then slash the repository ID slash the ID of the digital object, right? Um, what you also notice here is that the date fields are repeated, right? DC date, although in this case, this is um, what you might call qualified Dublin call that's evolved to DC terms or something, but qualified Dublin call uh, in that even though we are repeating the date element, but we are trying to signal the fact that there's a specific date that we want to associate to this digital object. In this case, the issue date is the date when this person submitted this dissertation uh, to DRIGS after making the corrections. The available is the date when this digital object was available in the repository, right? The action date is usually the same as the available date. This is uh, the ingestion date typically, right? It might change in the event that there's an embargo or something on the on the on the manuscript. Uh, for colleagues that normally uh, churn out patents or something, there's people in engineering fields or in, in maybe I guess in National School of Natural Sciences or something. I don't know if this is making sense, right? So two key features for Dublin Core: repeatable and it's also optional. Just these 15 elements, really powerful. And in fact, if you were to speculate, if you think about it. And if you were to, to really look at uh, the metadata that you typically find in your PDF, um, now I haven't really looked at this, but I would wager that this, this could literally be using Dublin Core actually, implicitly anyway, could be. Um, anyway. All right, so in terms of how, how these, um, these, these metadata elements, the 15 metadata elements are used, like what, what they represent. Um, the, the beauty with, with most of these things, most of these standards is um, they, they act more as guidelines, right? And so the implementation of those guidelines would be specific to an organization. So for instance, uh, UNSA, I, I suspect, or I expect, I've never really talked to Zachary about this, but I suspect UNSA has come up with the policy on how they use these, these tags, right? Uh, what sort of um, qualified elements they use, right? Do you, are we going to use as UNSA if we're ingesting an ETD? Are we going to say dc.contributor.advisor or dc.contributor.supervisor, right? because it turns out that in other places, they use the word supervisor. Elsewhere, they are called advisor, right? UNSA uh, makes reference to the people that we, you work with when you're, uh, when you're doing a PhD or master's as being supervisors. Uh, in other places, um, like I think in the United States, if you're doing a PhD, that person is called an advisor, right? Because they're advising you, they're not supervising you, but when you're doing a master's, they are called a supervisor, right? So there are all these different things that you need to think about. And these all feed into your policy, right? Typically this policy will manifest itself in the form of a, a so-called institutional repository policy or something, right? where you have those gory details of what people are supposed to do when they're ingesting content, right? But anyhow, so the title, according to the guidelines, the title is nothing more than the, the name associated with the digital object itself, the resource, right? This would be the bit stream. Uh, the creator would be the entity that created that object. Now, if you think about the creator here, you immediately realize that um, you can view creator from so many different angles, right? Um, and for you to understand here, I'm going to, again, swap to show you the metadata elements associated with this PDF document. You will notice that uh, this is horrible, but typically sometimes the creator would be the software, right? Now, because I was injecting this content, which is why the creator is light on period, but in an ideal case, it would be like the piece of software, or the, soft, the, the software library that was used to generate this PDF document, right? So this, these are all things to think about. Uh, they are specific to policy associated with the application, in certain instances, policy associated with the organization itself, right? Um, 
right? So that's the creator, is the entity that created the resource. You can view the creation of the resource from so many different angles. Like in the, just, the, the example I just gave here is the creation is done by the software, for instance. The subject is nothing more than um, a topic that you want to associate to the, to the resource itself or the digital object. Um, and, and it's almost always the case that uh, you have diff uh, you have more than one subject that you typically associate to a resource. So for instance, if we were to, to tag this presentation we are doing right now, right? This Moji 6 presentation with subjects, we could, we could decide to say one of the subjects is going to be uh, uh, postgraduate courses, one of the subjects is going to be digital libraries, because all these subjects are linked to this particular PDF document that, that I'm using to present, to present this talk, right? Um, so essentially what the subject does is uh, it, it describes the topic you want to associate with the resource. A description is nothing more than just some generic textual uh, content that will provide more details about the resource. Uh, in the case of ETDs, it would be like abstract. Uh, in the case of a YouTube video, it would be just uh, some, some vague description about the video, right? Some auxiliary information that will help contextualize the title of the, of the video itself. But again, the description could be anything. Uh, in fact, if you look at um, most of these repositories where people have given careful thought about how they're going to tag their digital objects, you will find that part of what they do with the description is they, 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 they use the description to provide citation, how the object should be cited. I'm, I'm going to go back here and uh, try and showcase something to you and I hope this works out. Again, if we use this as an example and view the full metadata record, and if we search for description, you'll find that we have, um, oh, there's just one description here, which is just abstract, which is such a shame. I wonder what they're using for the, for the, ooh, this is, this is highly unusual. What, what they've decided to do here is that if you notice, what I was expecting them to do is to use the description element to specify the citation. But instead what they're doing is the citation, like for Chicago citation, if you notice this, they're using, they're using the identifier, um, the identifier element, which is, which is a bit strange here. But anyway, it's strange for me, but for them it makes sense because it's probably part of their policy, right? They've decided to say, well, we're going to use the identifier element to do this. Okay. Um, and the publisher is just the, the, the organization of the entity that made, um, that made the, the resource available. Um, one way of thinking about this as well is the, the, the organization that you transfer copyright access to, right? So in the case of UNSA, for instance, once you submit that dissertation, the publisher will be the investor of Zambia. Um, in other instances, you could view the publisher, if it's a book, is the, the actual publisher that published that book, right? Again, this is dependent on the sort of policy that you have as an organization. Um, and then the contributor would be entities that helped produce the resource, right? So um, this is the reason why for ETDs, for instance, you've noticed that for the UCT repository, uh, ETDs have ad advisors and supervisors uh, being tagged as contributors. I think someone wants to get in, sorry. I'm wondering if, uh, because it's a Friday, that's why we have 11 people here, but anyhow. Oh, and by the way, I don't know if those of you that went to thing, I just remembered something. I know my colleagues at work are not very happy that I, I missed, there's a party. And I sat there and thinking, there's a party, but there's Corona, right? They've gone out and Dr. Mochalim, I don't know if you're familiar with him. Uh, he's a veteran, he's retired now. And so there's a fellow party or something. So maybe I should have gone to the, party, I suppose, seeing as there's 12 people anyway. But um, contributor, right? It's the entity that helped produce the resource. Um, and then the date, obviously, this is a no-brainer. I'm guessing a lot of people are, uh, can already put two and two together here. This is usually a period in time that you want to associate to the resource. And, and really, this is the reason why you notice we had multiple dates or repeated date fields for ETDs, right? because you might want to associate different types of dates, like the date when the resource was ingested into the repository, the date when the resource was made available in the repository, publicly available in the repository, 
the date when the resource was actually published. In the case of ETDs at UNSA, it's the date when you submit that thing to DRIGS for graduation. This is usually December, the, the, uh, December, the month of December, the previous year before you graduate. So if you plan to graduate next year, for instance, you'd be submitting this manuscript sometime in December this year, right? Um, and then the type is just, uh, the second is generic and it's contextual, but it's the nature of the resource. Um, usually, uh, by default, most repositories or digital libraries will associate the type of bit stream, right? So it's not uncommon for you to come across this. You, and this, by the type is, by the way, is administrative metadata. So we cannot find it. We'll not be able to find it uh, on the public interface. We need to use the OIP image protocol. If you notice, the type, well, this is horrible. The type is, is tagged as a thesis. So that's, I guess, policy-wise here. Um, in this case, UNSA has decided uh, to use something else. So it'd be interesting to look at a different type of resource here. Not a thesis, but something else. Let, let me, let, let's just, let's, this, is, this is good. Let's try and see if we can, uh, hmm, this records. Let's try and see if we can, uh, I see. Let's try and see if we can uh, we can find an entity that's not an ETD here, so that we see. Yeah. By the way, in case you're wondering, I'm trying to see what sort of type they're going to associate to something that's not an ETD. It's, it's likely that they would, uh, they would perhaps, uh, maybe they would call it a preprint or something, or research article or something. So let me try and see if we can find an actual article. We'll go to the School of Natural Sciences, which has two publications, and then we'll, hmm, and then we'll go here, um, and then we'll get this thing here. I, I I don't know if this is making sense, by the way. Feel free to interrupt me if um, if you need to seek clarification. Get record and, and files. Go to. Oh, oh my goodness! This is horrible. Uh, I don't find looking for. I, I haven't mastered the the pattern that they're using as a naming scheme. By the way, remember our discussion of identifiers uh, yesterday, where we said you need some sort of consistent naming scheme. If you look at Unza, for instance, here, you immediately realize that the naming scheme uh, uses OAI full column D space Unza ZM the repository. Anyway. So identifiers need to be that. This is 108. So about that, I don't need this. I just need the metadata format. Sorry, spelling of metadata format. Metadata format. Um, so what I'm trying to do here is, by the way, is I want to access, I'm trying to access um, an, an object that is not an, a thesis so that we see what type it's, it's associated with. But I see it's, it's taking quite a bit of time to load. Uh, I wonder why. I, I didn't see, I said metadata here. Yeah. Meta, wow. Ah, let's try and see if we can see the actual record here. Let's get the prefix. Oops. How about that? Just want to make sure that this is actually working. We have it done differently.
Oh, it's prefix, metadata prefix, not metadata format, okay. Uh, There's no metadata format here. This thing is acting out. Do I have metadata format? I can do it. Uh, okay. This is very strange. about that. Sorry for the breaking transmission. I'm trying to figure out what we've done wrong here. I don't think we've done anything wrong. It's like metadata prefix, which is fine. Perhaps this will work if we open it in a new window completely, maybe. This is very strange indeed. So what I will do is I'll just replace the, the ID with this. And hope that this works. Should be able to work. And I hope we haven't even lost track of what we're doing here. So I'll just replace the, the part that we have here. Yes. Uh, get ID, and then I'll replace the ID with the Unza ID, which is this. I'll replace this thing here with the Unza ID. And then just uh, hope that this works. It should be able to work now, I hope. It's very strange. Anyway, it looks like uh, this thing is not wanting to work here. I've become, I've become, uh, I've become, I've become obsessed now to find out exactly why this is uh, not working out. Let's see the metadata format. It's here. Um, Wow, this is very strange indeed. More strange is why this is not working. I'm beginning to think that, uh, just a second, uh, let me just check if the UCT uh, is going to work without an issue here. Uh, And by the way, all this will make sense very, very soon because part of what we're looking at today is uh, uh, this is, we're using this product as a case, um, as a case example, and this is even worse, right? The identifiers are messed up. Hmm. Okay. Uh, let's get a prefix, we'll say get record. 
Fire. Oh, so there's something I'm doing wrong there, clearly. Someone is saying. Oh, uh, could you try to, could you ask her to to try and get in again, and then I'll accept her request. I'm wondering why she's sorry about that, Miss Euphemia. Um, there's, there's, there's something wrong with the verb here. I guess the way I'm using the verb. Let me, let's just look up uh, right image, get the verb example. Maybe let's go to the actual source here and try and see if we can we can find. If we can find the the actual get record verb, hope there's an example on the official site. Okay, and this is this is actually working just fine. Very strange. Get record, identifier. Oh, there we go. There's something missing here. Get record. Ah, so the is G. Get record. Oh, I don't think that that should be an issue. Get record identifier or IGC. Metadata prefix. IGC. <clears throat> Let's see if the uh, investor of Zambia, if this fails, then we just proceed and then I'll look at it later on to see if, uh, if we can find a workaround. Quite strange. Now it's my connection, I don't know. Uh, so, so I don't know, so as we're waiting here, I hope all of this is uh, making a bit of sense here. Uh, let's not lose track of the fact that uh, we are discussing the, uh, the Dublin Core Metadata Scheme and specifically what we're trying to verify here is to see exactly how UNSA treats the type element. Type happens to be one of the 15 Dublin Core Metadata elements. And this, this is what has traditionally been referred to as uh, simple Dublin core, right, the 15. You also have qualified Dublin core where you, why is this thing acting up today? Wonder. Ooh. Oh, yes. I'm wondering why this thing is acting up today. I don't know why. Um, such a shame anyway. Uh, it would have been nice to see the the types, the type tags, uh, but I guess this doesn't want to work. We'll revisit this later on. We'll hopefully, to be able to open up at some stage, I think it should be the, the verb should be fine now. But in the event that we're unable to do this, I'm sharing the link later on at your time. You probably want to visit that uh, that link. When you visit that link, you should be able to to see the different type tags. And actually, now that we've we sort of like maybe establish that uh, we are doing the right thing by way of uh, the tags that we're using. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps it would, it would actually serve us better if we came here and, uh, and then attempted to and then attempted to OI. Oh, yeah. 
Right. So we know that the verb is correct now, but this is a, it's, the thing is, this is bad. This is for UCT. We wanted to look at the invest of Zambia. So I just, uh, I just got this particular ID here, right? What you notice with UCT is they treat the type tag to specify, I guess, the type of publication, and then they further qualify this, is, if it's a thesis or dissertation, at what level to use type. This is honors. Uh, type of degree, right? So that they're using the type, the type tag to actually uh, provide different types of information here. I don't know if this is making sense. Um, if you were to compare what we're looking at here, this is from UCT, if we were to compare what is from UCT to what is coming from UP to what's coming from UNSA, which is not working now, you would appreciate the fact that these different organizations treat these elements differently. And it makes sense because they have different policies, right? Anyway, on with it. Probably want to visit that later on, the UNSA thing later on. The, the format is what I was mixing the type with. So this would be like the format of the bit stream. So if it's an image, you use an ISO representation of the actual specific type of, of uh, bit stream, which is an image. So usually application slash the three letter, uh, three letter ISO code representing the application. So if it's a PDF document, you see application slash uh, PDF, right? Again, you can hopefully see this and all of these things. There we go, format, you see this? We see format application slash PDF for you. So if, if, if this object was, let's say a video for instance, or, or if it was an image, then you'd probably have slash JPG for instance, or PNG depending on the type of format of image that they used. Right? Uh, and for the most part, the application, the digital library system itself that you're using will figure out the application type. So this is not, this is not a tag that you specify when you're ingesting the object as, as, as a person who administers this repository. It's done behind the scenes for you because it turns out that it's very easy for you to figure out what sort of, a, what sort of file format you're working with. Okay, um, uh, the identifier is obviously, um, I guess it's pretty much intuitive here. This is the uh, often numeric represent, I guess a combination of different characters that uniquely identify the digital object within the repository um, and also outside the repository if the repository is connected to the internet, for instance. Um, source is nothing more than the um, the, 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 the entity that was used to derive the, the resource itself. And again, this is usually contextual, right? Uh, language is usually associated with the, the, the actual language that was used to produce the, the digital object. So if it's a PDF document, if it's a square research output, and it was authored in Nyanja, it would be Nyanja, right? If it's in English, it would be English. Now, I have no idea if Nyanja, Silozi, or Chitonga, if they have ISO representations, I'd like to think they do. So if, if they have ISO representations and you would use the code, English is ENG or is it EN? Uh, hopefully Nyanja has its own uh, ISO representation. I thought I had someone wanting to come in. I'm just gonna go here, no, no. Oh, uh, so someone is saying, just in the captions. Can you see my screen by the way? Or is it, is it just, Adrian is saying he's just seeing the captions. Is that the case for everyone else? Can you, can you see the screen? Okay, so Adrian, you probably want to check your, your Google Meet. So uh, just make sure you click the, you search for light on and then you click the one that has presentation in the, oh. Oh, so all of you can see my screen then. Okay. Great, okay. No, me, okay, I can see. <clears throat> I can see the screen, but right. I can't so follow what you're working on. I don't know, I don't know. Oh. It's, it's oh, just okay. written so presentation. Oh. 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 Sorry, so I've, I've opened the slides now. Can you see the slides? Yes, we can see them. I can okay. see them, okay. sorry. Okay. The Dublin Core Metadata Scheme. Yes, thank you. Yes. So if you're able to see the screen, you probably just want to double check. Um, 
maybe log out and log back in or something. So, so I was talking about language. This is interesting, right? Something to think about here. If you, let's say if there's a resource, and I know for most organizations, like most universities, or maybe UNSA, uh, I know that the researchers at UNSA that uh, double in research associated with languages, right? And they produce these short books in, uh, or literature in Chewa, in Bemba, in Silozi. I have a sneaking suspicion that if the repository was, was, was available, I have a sneaking suspicion that maybe the language that is used to, oh, and the UNSA one finally came through, by the way, this is it. So, okay, you see the type there, if it's not an ETD, they just say article, right? It's not very descriptive, but that's fine. I guess it's policy, I suppose. Uh, so what I was, um, what I was talking about, by the way, is um, in the event, right, that someone, let's say you're working for um, a university or a college where people teach uh, one of these local languages and they sometimes produce articles in, or maybe books, right, or book chapters in Chao, for instance. Uh, the question is, Tumbuka, I know Benson Tumbuka. Tumbuka. I know Benson uh, obsesses a lot about this. He's produced, he's produced some short, there we go. Uh, not quite. Let's let's see here. So this is Benson. Let's let's see the language here, right? I hope I do hope this is written in in Isenga. Maybe not. I don't know. I'm 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 praying that it's it's written in Isenga. I want to show you something, right? The importance of policy here. There you go. So if you look at this thing here, right? This whole this whole thing here is in. It's not in English, right? In an ideal case, what we were supposed to do in this UNSA repository. Right? Because this thing is not authored in English. The language was supposed to be specified to have been, and I'll change this so that it, it, this object so that it points to this. The language here, please let the language be there. I can't see the language. It's not even there actually. It's, it's, it's even missing, they missed it out. So, but the language should have been specified as, 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 uh, as being Senga somehow, <laughs> right? Now, now I have a feeling that, that the reason why this is missing, and I'm just speculating here, but the reason why this could be missing is because um, when, when you're going through this workflow in this space, and now I'm moving up and uh, around here, but I, I want you to maybe get Get the message I'm trying to put across. I'll, I'll just try and see if I can log in here. I hope I will be able to log in. Please let me be able to log in. I want to show you exactly what typically happens when you are, I can log in. So if I want to, let me see if I can submit something here. Submissions. Uh, I'll just go here, and then I'll just say resume. I want to see if I can get back to the part where I specify the language. Uh, the thing, the reason why the language is missing there is when you're going through this workflow in this space to ingest the content, it's a controlled, the language is, remember our discussion of controlled vocabularies? It's, it's a, you have a lookup and you, see, you notice that in the lookup, there's no Nyanjo Bemba here. At the very least, they should have tagged it as other instead of leaving it out. But the reason they were able to leave it out on this piece of text that is written in Insenga is because Dublin core is repeatable and optional, right? So the people in the library just decided to say, well, if Insenga is not part of the drop-down list here, um, then we'll just leave it, won't include it here. Right? Um, by the way, changing the configuration so that you include the other languages here is not that hard. You just go to the back end and then make just simple modifications and then the other languages can appear here. Nyanja, Senga, Bemba will appear here. I'll be surprised if there are no ISO codes associated with Bemba and Senga. Uh, language ISO code. Bemba. Yep, there you go. 
there's an ISO code for Bemba, right? And it's it's on the Library of Congress website, right? So, uh, so I guess another another lesson to learn here is that um, if you work for this large um, uh, organization or institution which produces uh, material in one of the, I guess, local languages, Zambian languages, original languages, whatever I want to refer to them, or native as they used to call them, then you'd have to change the configuration so that uh, so that it, it 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 actually includes the other languages, right? So LOZI has has an ISO as well, LOZ. Right? Uh, you want to use you want to use this you want to make sure that you include you you use the ISO because it turns out that these languages that you are seeing as part of this drop down here. This is what you see on the interface, but what is encoded in the metadata, what's inserted into the database is the ISO code itself, not the description. I don't know if I'm making sense. Yes, no? Maybe. Is this making sense? The, the code, code that you find, uh, see this? The language on the front end will be English, right? But the actual thing that's inserted into the database, the actual thing that's associated with the metadata is the ISO code, ENG in this case, right? Um, anyway, on with it. So that's, that's the language. And then the, the relation would be a, a way of specifying how certain objects might be related to each other. Now, this is contextual, but a classic example is the way uh, digital objects are ingested into the user repositories. Sometimes an article or an ETD will be, will be uploaded in parts. I, I, I've always thought this is very strange, but it's not uncommon for you to find a digital object that will have three dis, uh, bit streams. So there'll be a cover page. There'll be the, the references uploaded separately and the actual uh, body of text, right? Which I've always thought was quite strange here. So the way that you, you'd specify that those things are related is by making use of the relation element. Right? Um, and then coverage here would be, I mean, if you're working with your spatial um, digital objects here, it should be like GPS coordinates or something. Um, but it could be, it could range from GPS coordinates to the jurisdiction, for instance, if, if you think that's important, if it's not important, then you just leave it out because all these elements are optional. Um, rights is usually things associated with copyright and intellectual property, right? Um, so for, for Square, Square research output, this is extremely important. You want to specify if, if, if the object is associated with the Creative Commons license, um, or if, 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 it's, if, if it's associated with a different type of license, right? And that's important because remember that there are external services out there that will typically harvest content from a repository. Uh, so maybe those repositories would decide on whether to harvest not just the metadata, but the bitstream as well, depending on the sort of copyright that is associated with the digital object. All right, so uh, it's just the guidelines of what you typically use the 15 elements for, right? Uh, but how you get to implement these elements is dependent on the policy that you come up with as an organization. This is the thing here, policy is extremely important. Uh, so just uh, some, a walkthrough of uh, examples of Dublin Core here, right? Um, what you're looking at here is uh, uh, an example from our UNSA institutional repository, right? Notice here we have the contributor element, contributor, date, 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 identifier, description. Um, and, and by the way, right, I guess now would be the time, I don't know if I mentioned this. Um, yesterday, we introduced this idea on notion of embedded metadata and external metadata, right? The two examples that I gave for PDF documents and uh, JPEG, right, those, those photos that you normally take with your smartphone, I, I highlighted the fact that the metadata that is associated with those types of digital objects are embedded metadata. But in the case of digital objects that you find in a repository, the metadata is external metadata. Um, and as it turns out, this external metadata is actually inserted or stored into the database, right? So, so everything you're seeing here, these things here, 
Laozi, Felicia, Kakandewa, Kakandewa. These things are stored in a database. The bitstream itself, the PDF document is on the file system. But because this institutional repository here, this DSpace is a content management system, when a person is accessing this application on the interface, the information is dynamically generated. So it's pulled, the metadata is pulled from the database and combined or associated with the bitstream, which is a PDF document. And then the user is, is presented with the illusion that this information is actually, um, it's, it's, it's coming from the same source, but in actual fact, it's not coming from the same source, right? I thought I'd mention that. Um, uh, and then it turns out really that uh, uh, what you're seeing here is what is also referred as qualified Dublin Core. Because simple Dublin Core only has those 15 elements and because it's generic in nature, um, there is a way of you explicitly specifying what the different fields are all about. And one way of doing that is by using so-called DC terms or qualified Dublin Core, right? So you, you provide additional context to the 15 elements, right, by qualifying them. And the way that you qualify, you qualify them is you just use the dot operator. So date dot, description dot, publisher dot, right? Type dot, uh, contributor dot, right? Um, and again, there's no explicit, um, there are no explicit guidelines on what sort of, uh, what sort of qualifiers you use. Um, there are people that have come up with so-called application profiles, if you look them up, but but, but ideally this is linked to policy as well, right? So UNSA, for instance, has decided to just say, we're going to use dc.publisher. Other institutions out there might decide to say, no, we want to, if it's ETDs, we want to know which department, which school. So then you'd have to come up with a qualified version of publisher so that you have dc.publisher dot department, publisher dot school or faculty, publisher dot institution, right? So you notice that you repeat the, publisher element three times so that you specify the department where the student came from, the school where the student came, came from or did the PhD or master's from, and the institution itself. This is all important information that other entities out there might be interested in. And in fact, impo important information that you might want to render on the public interface as users are accessing the content. Why, if I'm a student that has just enrolled for a master's program at UNSA, and I'm, I'm, I'm not into the MLIS program. I, I don't care about uh, content generated by the School of Engineering, right? Um, but because I'm in the School of Education, I, I could just go to um, the type tag that links that, that ETD or that manuscript to the School of Education. But again, you notice that the School of Education has a number of departments, right? Adult Education, Library and Information Science, Mathematics, is it mathematics and science, science or something, right? I'm not interested in all those things. The only thing I'm interested in is content coming in from the Department of Library and Information Science. In which case, it would perhaps be important that we come up with um, repeated fields for the publisher so that we specify the department. We also specify the school, we specify the institution. And not just specifying the institution like we are currently doing. Now, again, because of how these uh, so-called digital library systems are implemented, there are different ways of achieving the same goal. In the case of UNSA, what they do, distinguish these different uh, artifacts is, they'll use hierarchical structures called collections and sub-collections. <clears throat> so, well, that's not the case for ETD. So what I mean is, when you come to, when you come to the dispatch repository, uh, what you see on top here is a collection, a community. Uh, the, the structure that UNSA decided to come up with is for preprints. Inside this community, a community is mapped onto a school, but inside the school you have departments, right? Yeah? If we go to the School of Education, we will find departments inside and we will find lists here. Right? So uh, you're achieving the same goal by making use of structural metadata in this case, but you could also do the same thing by Encoding this descriptive information. Sorry, Dr. Yes, yes. Someone needs to be let in. Oh, okay. Uh, I wonder who it is. We can have them uh, try to access the thing again now. I didn't hear the end of this. Ask them to access 
Uh, okay, we go. So yeah. I've got a question. Yes. Yeah, my question is on uh, the metadata where you are saying that, uh, yes, this is interface where which helps users to access content in the in the repository. Now, yes. uh, suppose the terms that has been, the subject terms that has been assigned to uh, the document, uh, the user, when the user is coming to search and is not finding, is not using those um, terms that which has been assigned to the PT streams, is there a way that these library systems are able to link? Uh, suppose what is what 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 he knows is the topic within is a topic or subtopic within a document. Is there a way these systems are able to link the user based on the uh, content, not based on the metadata? Yes, and, and this is this is a topic of discussion for module number number seven, information retrieval systems. It turns out that these digital library systems are set up in such a way that you can activate what they call full text search. Okay. Right. So you do not by default, when a user searches in your digital library like an institutional repository running in this space, what they're doing actually is they're searching through the metadata element or so the metadata tag. So when I'm searching for when I'm searching for when I'm searching for content in, when I'm searching for something, let's say I type in pew pew, I'll be searching through these things here. The metadata itself. So when I search for a candela, by the way, what I'm searching through is I'm searching through the metadata. But when you're dealing with documents like PDF documents, for instance, you can index the content in the document. So effectively, you'd be indexing all the text that is in that PDF document. So that when so a user searches, the search propagates not just into the metadata, but also the text that is in that PDF document. Now, now granted, uh, you immediately realize that there are challenges associated with repositories or digital library systems that have scanned documents. Scanned documents where even when you apply what they call optical character recognition, it's difficult for you to extract text. So the answer yes is the answer is yes. It is possible. It is possible by indexing the content itself, the bit stream. Assuming, assuming the content can be indexed, you cannot index sound. You cannot index video. You can index text. You cannot index an image. So if you're dealing with images. There's no other way. You'd have to make sure that uh, uh, the metadata that you are supplying or that you are associating to the digital object is comprehensive enough that it covers the broad spectrum of the different keywords that the user will be typing in to search for content. Now, now this is where you, you people come in, right? Because a typical, at least I'm not an expert here, but correct me if I'm wrong, a typical organization that has a, a full-fledged library we normally have what they call subject librarians, right? This is where you come, you come in here so that when you're indexing the people, when those people are indexing content into the UNSA institution repository, if it's, a, if it's an ETD coming from engineering, there should be a subject librarian who understands engineering uh, literature, right? So, so that uh, when you read through the title and the abstract, you immediately not say the subjects that we're supposed to tag this document with or this object with these tags here. And now, now in the event where you, this is, a, like this is a, in an ideal case, right? Um, I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong here, Adrian, but I don't think we do this at, at UNSA. Last time I asked, there are just two people that were responsible for ingesting content into the repository. So these are the people that will, uh, receive the ETDs and the preprints that are coming in from the different uh, faculty, faculty staff from UNS and the, the ETDs that are generated by the students. And then these people will do this, right? They'll prepare metadata because when the document comes in from DRIGS, the ETD, it doesn't come with the metadata, right? So as, a, as, a, as, a, as an expert, I, I am told, right, with that students that have conducted studies about this, by the way, which we think is a problem, and which is why we, 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 we've actually carved out research problems around to this. But a subject librarian is supposed to read the title. You open up the document and then you read the title. 
at the very minimum, right? And then you also read the abstract. Based on what you've read, based on what is in the abstract and what is in the title, you yourself will be able to say the subjects that we should associate this object with are these. Now, now this, is, this is where things become extremely interesting, right? This is where the idea of a controlled vocabulary set actually comes in. Not only that, but the idea of ensuring that you use what they call a subject vocabulary, right? Right now, what UNSA does is they use a generic uh, library of Congress subject headings. But think about this for a second. We have content that comes from School of Medicine. We have content that comes from education. We have content that comes from engineering, natural sciences. If you look at natural sciences, natural sciences has chemistry, biology, physics, computer science, right? All these different disciplines and domains are typically associated with specific subject controlled vocabulary. But we don't do that, right? Which makes it harder. And perhaps this is something that we take for granted because we have a repository that just has 5,000 <laughs> objects, right? So you sit there and you're thinking, ah, it's fine, right? We can get away with that. But when you're dealing with large scale data where you have millions of objects, you want to carefully think about how you're tagging these objects, especially when it comes to subjects. To avoid errors, you use a controlled vocabulary set. To ensure that you're tagging the objects with the correct things, useful subjects, you make sure that you use a subject controlled vocabulary. All right, so the study that I shared with you, uh, the study that this fourth years did last year, was they went around to find out which subject headings they typically use. So they went to VET to find out, they went to School of Medicine, right? We know that School of Medicine will typically use uh, what they call MESH, right? Um, we know that uh, specific departments, like the Department of Computer Science, we typically use so-called ACMS, CSS concepts. You know, so these are, these are things to think about when you're setting up a repository, when you're coming up with a policy. And in your case, it's a policy. Uh, and, and I hope this is going to sink in, right? People are always a problem. You have control over the technology. People are always going to be a problem. And it's not just, think of people um, as encompassing even the people that work in the library. You will need guidelines to specify to people to say when you are ingesting this content, this is how you're supposed to ingest it. So that they're doing the right thing. So that if you hire somebody else to come and take over from someone who goes out there for greener pasture, they'll be able to continue doing the right thing, right? I, so I don't know if I, I asked, your question about uh, how people find content. I, I know I, I talk about a lot of things here, but I'm hoping that kind of answers your question, hopefully. Yes, it has. Yeah, I, I don't know what you, I'm gonna pause for a little while here. Talking uh, sometimes can be, it can't be useful at all. But I'd, I'd like to find out if people have had experiences in terms of uh, this, this experiences with subject headings, like what sort of approach you use at your respective workplaces if this is an area that you typically take into account. Now tagging, right? But don't think about this in terms of digital library. That digital library is, no, no, no. Uh, but when you say you, you use OPAC and whatnot, how do you tag these books, right? Do you use controlled vocabularies when you're cataloging this thing? Any thoughts on that? I don't know if I'm making sense here. And I know you know what I'm talking about because you are the experts here, right? Hello? Yes. Yes, we, when we're cataloging information resource, we, we use controlled vocabulary. Uh -huh. There is a, uh, what is? Remind me again, Harry, there, where, where is it? <laughs> CBO. <laughs> uh -huh, <yeah. laughs> Thank you. Now, I was yes. going to come back. I, 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 oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. I, I, I was waiting. I was deliberately want, I wanted to put it on record so that you say, so that people know, because very soon I was going to shoot at CBU. I always shoot at UNSA, but I'm going to shoot at CBU, where the repository has been dead for years now. But, but, uh, but anyway, so yes, continue. So I wanted to put it out there. <laughs> yes, when you are assigned, when we are at login and we reach a stage where I was supposed to assign a subject heading to the information resource, 
we have uh, we don't just uh, come up with any any word or maybe when you look at the title and you get some words and uh, take them as subject no we have uh, controlled uh, vocabulary in the authority you know we use library of congress and uh, whatever we uh -huh. do it's uh, the library of congress that we've borrowed those subjects and whatever research whatever book that has been published it is in the library of congress database so there are these uh, subjects the uh, controlled vocabulary that are in the authority that we use so that we guide whoever comes should be restricted to using the same words that are in the authority not just any other thing we are really controlled because we don't want to to do the duplication yeah and, and I, I know this is done meticulously in your profession because i, I think there are numerous courses which you do uh, and i know this but but um the issue here is, uh, and I guess the issue to think about is, uh, it depends on the resource anyway, but the issue to think about yes. here is that uh, in the event of the example I just gave where you have an institution like CB where you have engineering, you now have uh, medicine, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the question to ask is, yes. should you yes. use a generic, and there's no correct answer to this, but the question to ask yourself is, should you use a generic, um, uh, I guess uh, controlled vocabulary like the Library of Congress um, subject headings, uh, in preference for the most subject specific controlled vocabularies, right? I don't know. I don't know what the answer is here, right? Which is, which is where I was leading up to. But, but the interesting thing is um, if you look at yesterday, I don't know if people were around here, but I opened up this document, right? And um, now it would be interesting to ask Zachary when he comes through, I think it's on Wednesday when he gives his talk on Wednesday, to ask him to say, when these guys last year did the analysis, they came up with this, to ask him to say, or, or I'll ask you guys, right? It's, how, how exactly do you tag things using the Library of Congress? Would you say this is coming from the Library of Congress, what we have here? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. These, no. these, these things here. We, we... It's like this is uh, already embedded in the in the in the yeah, database. Uh, right. That so, uh, especially the academic library we use library of Congress. So okay. it's already there in the it's embedded in the in the database. So all we mm. do is just to get what is already there, and if it's yeah. similar to the subject that you are cataloging, then you just yeah. place it there because they are not supposed to be one you might have maybe even three that are, are related you know you kind of right. breaking down from the general to the specific right right anyway so there's, there's different there's no thank you for that there's no um there's no there's no correct answer to this but um i guess the only thing i, I would do is if, if it were me right listen i have a background in computer science right whenever i'm looking for content online I've become so familiar with a specific controlled vocabulary. That's the SMCSS concept. Uh, and, and in fact, most of the academic databases that uh, I will access, like SEM, for instance, will use those CSS concepts. Most subject repositories that archive computer science specific content out there will do the same thing. So, uh, who, who is that? Subject. This is what I'm referring to here. So, this particular subject repository, which is computer science centric, we typically use these phrases, which uh, this is not Library of Congress subject headings. Now, now again, if you think about it, um, maybe the argument you'd come up with is why should we obsess so much about this? Is it really important? I don't know. Maybe it might be important in certain instances, in certain instances it might not be important, right? Uh, certainly when I'm browsing for content myself, if, I, if I'm browsing for content using, a, using subjects that I'm familiar with, in this case is a CS, uh, CS, CCS concepts, it becomes a lot easier or faster for me to find what I'm looking for because this is familiar territory. The same goes for mesh, right? right? So there's no correct, uh, there's no correct, uh, I guess, correct way of doing this. Uh, maybe there is actually. I think there is a correct way. And the people that know the correct way is you. You yourselves, right? And this is part of what you're expected to do, I suppose. You come up with a policy. So you at CDU, Harriet, you came up with a policy to say, 
we are going to adopt the Library of Congress subject headings. Now, justification. Yes, just of, like you've just. Just like you've just said that uh, the reason why you use the, I don't know what you've just mentioned, is because you want to find whatever you are looking for. Equally, right. the right. subject heading, yes, the subject heading is, uh, you know, when you are looking for something and then you yes. don't have to limit yourself. So the subject to broaden your search, even as a user, is going to right. give you a lot. It's going to broaden your search to a lot of things that a lot of subjects that you are going to pick from you are not going to be limited but if you just align yourself to the title the title is just one and if you are going to be limited you're not going to find data that you are looking for i agreed i, I agree with you actually and so mm -hmm. by the way the, the couple of uh, most of these statements that i'm making are more like rhetorical statements because I'm, I'm trying to evoke like a bit of a discussion here around this but, but um <laughs> One way of looking at this, right, instead of bearing the burden of the complexity that you have, you can, you can, you can, you can make, you can set up your policy in such a way that the data work is done by the person who is creating the resource. So when a person is submitting an ETD, you tell DRGS to say, as a library, you go to DRGS if it's UNSA, you tell them to say, when a student is submitting their dissertation, if they are from engineering, let them look at these terms. These will be terms that are linked to the Library of Congress subject heading, obviously. Let them look at these terms and let them select at least five terms from here that best describe this content. Instead of having two people from the library read through the title, read through the abstract, and uh, decide to say these are the terms that we need. If you decide to do that, you're creating unnecessary work for yourself. Now, this is me from a layman's point of view here. This, this is my thinking. You're creating unnecessary work for yourselves. Um, you're making it increasingly, uh, well, you're making it increasingly more probable that errors are going to be introduced as you're tagging these resources. You're going to come up with uh, a very strange policy, not strange policy, but a, a policy that is a bit problematic where you say, the maximum number of keywords you associate is three. This is what the owners do. Last time I spoke to Zachary, this is what they told me. It's because, because it's a lot of work, right? It's, it's looking at a, an institution that has what? 854 plus faculty staff. This is just faculty staff, but we know that other people from some other support staff do publications. They are postgraduate students. Self-archiving is virtually dead. So these faculty staff and students do not log into the repository like the way Lighton and colleagues from this do where I can upload my own content. They will actually take thumb drives, right? I have colleagues that will say, no, I went to the library to tell them to upload this content for me, but they haven't yet uploaded the content for me, right? Even someone is furious and because I understand that it takes a lot of work, because I understand that the library has a backlog, I sympathize with the people from the library, but these other people don't sympathize. And so as a result, more work given to those two people in the library, right? So, Anyway, takeaway point is these are things to think about as you're coming up with the policy. Um, if you think that it's possible for you to implement self-archiving, Zachary will tell you that it's been a battle for UNSA, right? It's been a battle for years now. This repository has been around for years, but self-archiving is virtually dead. It is virtually dead, which is why you have very strange things. One publication from engineering, 70 from agricultural sciences. This, is, this makes no sense, right? So anyways, um, so subject headings. I, I know we were talking about qualified Dublin core, but we went on a tangent, but I still think these are important conversations that we should be having. Uh, and also seeing as uh, there are people here that work for various organizations, maybe when we attend uh, the annual conference, we might start talking about how best we can Harmonize things, right? Is it possible that we can adopt um, a common controlled vocabulary for tagging, let's say, ETDs, for instance, controlled subject vocabulary or something, so that in the event that we do decide to set up a national ETD portal, there's consistency, right? When 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 people are accessing content coming in from Unilas and CBU and Levi Mwanawasa uh, Medical University and, and Cavendish, there's some sort of consistency, right? I don't know, just putting it out there. Right, so it turns out that uh, simple Dublin core, which are these elements here, this is not enough. And so 
uh, smart people uh, many, many years ago came up with DC terms or otherwise uh, referred to as qualified Dublin Core. So the idea behind qualified Dublin Core, like I said, is um, you provide qualifiers to the 15 elements right, to provide more context. Um, so some examples here, you can notice here is uh, everything after the main or the simple Dublin Core element, one of the 15 elements, everything after the dot is the qualifier. Right, so it's called qualified Dublin Core. Advisor, right? is a qualifier for contributor in this case. Available is a qualifier for the date attribute. Uh, I think somebody wants to come in, or is it? Yes. Okay. Um, oh, by the way, before I lose this train of thought, I don't know if Kakandi will reach out to you. Apparently the exams are not going to be in August. I think he will formally write to you. He, he sent out a message, is it today or yesterday? Can't remember when. But he was saying uh, ID has confirmed the exams are going to be, uh, is it October, September, October or something. But anyway, so, so again, another example of qualified Dublin call here, you'll notice that um, uh, you have uh, a whole bunch of um, qualifiers here, right? Um, so, uh, publisher, type, uh, title there. Um, again, the qualifiers are dependent on your policy, right? You notice that uh, the, the, if you look up the application profiles that are available out there, there'll probably be nothing that to speak to the fact that the, there's a qualifier named qualification level. But, but perhaps what you might want to do as an organization is come up with qualifiers for ETDs that are linked to ETDMS, right? Although you can easily crosswalk metadata using qualified Dublin code to ETDMS, right? All right, so more examples here. This is the same information, but it's encoded differently. Like in this case, it's encoded using XML. Still, when you're pulling this information, in this case, you're pulling this information using a protocol like OIPMH, um, the OIPMH protocol this is the sort of um, output that you get back, right? And this is useful because the external services like OATD and the union catalog out there that are pulling this information will be able to make sense out of the data irrespective of what sort of qualifiers you're using, right? I don't know if you're, you, you, you're, you're able to link these different things together here. The fact that <laughs> these qualifiers that you have here when, when, I'm, when you're pulling this information using, using a protocol like OIPMH protocol, this is what you see, this is what you typically see, but on the interface of the repository itself, you're seeing things like this, right? So the qualifiers in most instances will be specific to the repository. All right. Um, uh, so again, just uh, if, if this was like a face-to-face -face interaction would have had a, a sort of like a, practical session where people experiment with this, but maybe we will do this on Sunday or something. But um, to give you a sense of how this is done using the front-end workflow from the admin's perspective in this space, um, this is a sort of workflow you'd otherwise go through, right? Once you log into this space uh, and you want to submit new content into this space, um, of course, I mean, you, you, you uh, specify the structural metadata by way of uh, indicating which collection, which community and collection or sub collection the content is going to be ingested into. And then you start going through the painful process of, and I call it painful because for each object, you go through how many steps? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight steps, right? The workflow has eight steps. Um, you know, each of these different steps here, you're providing metadata essentially. Uh, and if you think about this for a second, if you're not, I encourage you to think about this from the perspective of the three different types of metadata, administrative, descriptive, and structural. Right? It turns out that these different pages will, will, will allow you to specify those different things. Right? So they describe here, gives away the type of metadata you're dealing with. Anything to do with access, this is administrative metadata. right? Licensing or copyright and licensing, right? This is administrative metadata as well, right? So as you are, as you are providing this metadata, right? Um, you, you will provide this metadata by uh, 
either using simple Dublin core or qualified Dublin core. Now, I, I want to draw attention to a couple of interesting things here, by the way, because I don't want us to misrepresent the, oh, Dublin core is repeatable and optional here. What you'll notice for, for tools like this space is the way it's designed, this is designed in such a way that whether you like it or not, at the very least when you're uploading, by default, when you're uploading content, when you're uploading content into this space, you must at least provide a title, which is why if you notice the way title has an asterisk there, I don't know if you can see that star. All these other things can be optional, but you, you must at least provide a title, right? This thing here in this space. Um, this has nothing to do with the fact that Dublin Core is both optional and repeatable, by the way, but it's, just an, it's, it's, a, it's an implementation specific detail that, that, that is usually linked to just this space, right? And it makes sense at the very least when you're ingesting something into the repository, you should at least be able to specify the title, right? Anyway, uh, something else I want to draw attention to here, and we'll probably look at this in the practical on Sunday, but, um, you notice that uh, for, for, it's not just subjects where you get to look up um, information, but if, if you come from an organization like CBU, what you might want to do is come up with a controlled set of potential authors, so all faculty staff, so that when you want to upload something that has been authored by Harriet, you just, you just look up Harriet's name and then you click on the name and automatically populate Harriet's name here. The re the reason you want to do here is you want to avoid cases where you misspell names or you use a wrong casing, right? Maybe last week when somebody from the library was uploading content, they used a, camel, they used a sentence casing. The next time they're uploading content, they're using title casing. Uh, when the application sees that, it sees us as two different authors, right? So. To ensure that there's a bit of con uh, con con consistency here, you want to, to, to ensure that you look up information that can be looked up. So things like names and subjects, these are things that you can easily look up. Right? Anyway, so you go through this workflow where you, you are specifying uh, metadata, right? Uh, uh, in certain instances, you, you, you actually have drop downs to avoid errors here. I'm just going to quickly go ahead so that we look at the final output that you get after you go through this workflow, right? Uh, uh, oh, this thing is taking time, I'm wondering why. Oops. I do apologize, I think my machine is hanging suddenly. And to avoid this from happening, I think what I'm going to have to do is I'll have to close some of these things. I do apologize, just give me a Second, uh, I'll need to close one of these things. I have too many tabs open. I think I'll close this. And and, uh, and this as well. All right. So. All right, you notice that this workflow, right? The submission workflow that we're going through here, these different pages, these are the pages, the steps in the workflow that you go through. In all these different steps of the workflow, you're supplying metadata, right? Uh, and the metadata you supply is dependent on the, the sort of policy that you'd have come up with as, as an institution, right? In certain instances, you are you're using um, uh, uh, authority, you're looking up, um, an, an authority database so that you avoid errors like names, for instance, um, subject headings, right? So instead of typing text or copy pasting text, you instead, you search for content and then you click on the thing that, that comes up as a result, right? Um, and the idea behind you doing this, by the way, is that you avoid simple and trivial errors like uh, uh, typos, uh, uh, casing, uh, because these applications will treat information, the word information, as far as this space is concerned, this is different from this. It's different from this. Right? 
And which is why, if I, I hope I'll be able to see this, I, I hope we can find a classic example of uh, an author, maybe, I hope Unza has made this mistake, I do hope so. Please let them make this mistake so that I showcase, uh, I showcase, uh, hmm. I want to showcase an example, a typical example where you have, uh, aha, I don't know if you can see this. <laughs> you have two investors of Zambias, why? Because in, in one instance, of has uppercase O, in the other instance, of has lowercase O. But this is misleading, this is supposed to be the same thing, right? Because we're not using a lookup, you have instances where you have the University of Zambia, you have the University of Zambia, two of the University of Zambia. You have instances where, I'm sure, I would be surprised if there's a, a number of uh, authors that, uh, uh, I'm trying to see if we can find an author with the same name here. A, an author who's been entered twice. Um, perhaps not. I was so hoping I'd find, you know, you have Unza here, inconsistencies, right? Um, this is so sad. I was so hoping we could find that. Aha! If you look at this again, Lungu Getian, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. This has a as a dot in the middle name, right? F dot, which is why it appears like it's a, it's two different entities, but it's the same thing, right? So these are these are things to kind of like think about as you're implementing these repositories. Um, uh, I, I was chatting to, I was chatting to um, to uh, the back. the other time, the librarian from Zikas and uh, 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 we sat down and we're thinking they're consistent. And I think authors, you see this thing here? I don't know if you can see this thing here, it says the, uh, in the discover facet here, this leaderboard here. Now, you might, you might trivialize this, but for some people, their position is important, right? So if you have if you misspelled a name, that person would be ranked lower instead of being ranked higher because their name um, is being presented in different ways, right? So these are all different things to think about. To avoid that, all you have to do is use uh, authority control, right? Look up this information. I, I don't know if I'm making sense here, or maybe I'm just waffling around. Uh, any thoughts so far? Experiences maybe at work or? Uh, hello? Yes, hi. Yes, experiences are there whereby yes. you, you, you find, like the way you were giving an example of that name, which had, the other one has a dot, yes. and the other one hasn't a dot, but they're just the same names. So meaning yeah. they're representing different two people. But in exactly. the actual sense, it means one person. The way you present them to the user it will bring a different view of what you, you, you are telling the, the, the user. Yeah, so that's why consistency used to be there always to check with what you are doing. Okay, I see. Yeah, uh, it's, it's uh, I don't know what I was thinking. I was thinking about something related to what we're talking about here, but uh, these are all important things to, to think about really all really important things to think about. I've forgotten what I wanted to to talk about, about authority control, the importance of authority control. And I'm sure it wasn't important if I've forgotten. Anyway, uh, right. All right, so you notice that as you're going through this workflow, uh, in some portions, you're supplying, you know, uh, descriptive metadata, um, uh, administrative and structural metadata. And then finally, you come up uh, to this thing where you have the opportunity to just review the submission before you actually submit it, right? And then after you submit it, what you typically have access to is, is this on the front end. But remember that the metadata that you are, you are, you are supplying here as you're going through this workflow, once you save this, it's being inserted into a database. It's 
things inside a database and encoded in a certain way using these Dublin core uh, elements, right? Uh, the presentation is dependent on how it's being used. Uh, so when it's, when the digital object is being used from the public interface of this space, you'd have a more user-friendly sort of uh, view like this, right? Uh, like this. When it's being viewed from the perspective of the OIPMH protocol, for instance, what you see is, uh, is something that is similar to, to this. You can get the, it's something that's similar to this. Now, this view would typically be a view that an expert such as yourselves will be able to understand, right? Uh, but that, like your average end user will not be able to make sense out of this, right? Uh, and so these are things to think about, but the bottom line is uh, this content is being stored into the database and encoded in a certain way. Um, <clears throat> again, if you decided to say you are not going to use Dublin Core, you can choose not to use Dublin Core, by the way. So if you set up an, uh, a, a digital library that's going to, to uh, you're going to use to ingest just strictly electronic theses and dissertations, there's no point for you to use Dublin Core. From the get-go, you decide as an organization, you come up with a policy to say, we will encode the metadata using uh, ETDMS. If you decide to set up um, an OER repository, so let's say a digital library that is going to be used to, to store slides that are used by lecturers, tests or past exam papers, those are teaching and learning materials. The most appropriate metadata scheme would be something like uh, LOM, right? Learning object metadata, for instance. So you, you, you'd have to tweak the tool that you're using. If it's this space, it's very easy to, to tweak, by the way, although by default you use the Dublin Core, but you can change that. Right, so these are all different things to think about. Um, right, uh, looking at the time, we are supposed to look at uh, interoperability protocols. Uh, should we proceed or, I think we can proceed, right? I don't know, I'm looking at, this is one, what, 127, uh, there's a comment, I guess. Can a repository, uh, can a repository have, yes, yes, well, mm, mm, no, <laughs> no, no, it can. But, and that, that's, a, that's a good question, uh, Ms. Sharma here. It, it can't, but you, you can, you can, you can, you can cross-walk the codec process of converting one metadata scheme to the other, cross-walking. So you can cross-walk from one metadata scheme to the other. Observe, the UNSA right now, right, is a very strange repository, right? But as with many repositories, I'm sure there's a, a, a process out there. But the, the UNSA repository has, wait for it, we have preprints, these are journal articles, we have books. Oh, wait a minute, we have exam papers. Exam papers, these are classic teaching and learning resources. We also have electronic theses and dissertations. Student reports and whatnot. Uh, we have university collections, these are supposed to be like, uh, I guess, images in the archives or something, right? I, I think. But, but the thing to think about is the proper metadata scheme to encode ETDs with would be like uh, ETDMS. Right, you can get away with Dublin Core for these preprints. So, if there's an entity out there that is interested in harvesting, uh, in harvesting content, it, it, in, in harvesting ETDs from the University of Zambia a repository, bearing in mind that this repository has a mixture of content, what what the entity that is interested in harvesting ETDs would have to do is just ensure that when there are harvesting the content, observe, by default, right, the content is encoded using Dublin Core. But you can cross-walk this metadata. There's a slew of metadata formats that you can cross-walk it to, by default, using this space. So when I'm extracting this content, I can choose to say, I would like to extract this content not using, um, not using Dublin Core, but instead, you see by default, this is Dublin Core. Instead, what I want to use is I want to use Mark. Then the entity that will be harvesting the content will be harvesting this, not Dublin Core. I don't know if I'm making sense. If 
if if the entity that is harvesting this content is interested in using ETDMS, you just crosswalk it, right? Uh, and and really, crosswalk crosswalking is not that hard actually. You can if 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 the the metadata format you want to crosswalk to is not part of the list that comes by default with this space, creating or creating a mapping between what exists into the repository into what you want is a trivial process. It's not that hard. So you cannot, technically speaking, you cannot answer a question. You cannot use a mixture of metadata schemes. But what you can do is you can selectively crosswalk to what you want. Uh, so I, I hope that answers your question, Vale. Um, right. I, I don't know if there are any other questions here. So I was, I was about to ask, this is slide number 27. And then we have, uh, uh, we are going all the way up to, hmm. Wondering why I my my approximation skills have become so bad these days. We have about twenty four slides. Can we do? Can we do? Um, do you think we can do the uh, the protocol part, or we leave it for? I'm wondering why we took time here. I guess discussions. Can we look at the protocols now, or people would, would prefer that we we look at protocols tomorrow maybe. Any thoughts? It would be nice if we had a discussion about what we just spoke about maybe. Any thoughts? Uh, maybe just a recap of okay. what we have talked about. Okay. Any other thoughts? Brenda, do you, do you think we should uh, proceed uh, or we stop? Okay, we have a break. Uh, so so do, you, do you mean, Val, do you mean then we have a break and then we continue after maybe five or 10 minutes or we break off and then continue tomorrow? Sorry, Doc, I, I think we can just continue tomorrow. Yeah, because the thing here is, uh, I, I want to be very, we are talking about, uh, a number of things here, and, and I would prefer it if I give you time to, to synthesize these things instead of just uh, regurgitating things. And then, you know, I want this to make sense and for us to have more productive conversation. That's my thinking, though. But, uh, but if people are up to it, we can. Uh, so Brenda wants us to continue tomorrow as well. If you're up to it, we can easily continue. It's a Friday for me, and uh, I have nothing better to do. So I'm, I'm more than happy to continue. Uh, but, but I think we have. We, we have a bit of time. And in fact, the other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, what I was thinking of doing is instead of, uh, so we have a talk on Monday, we're supposed to have a talk on Wednesday, we're supposed to have a talk on Thursday. So what we can do is have another talk on Friday, and then instead of continuing off with um, information retrieval next week, we can extend this interaction by another week so that people have time to synthesize the content as we're having the talks and then we continue information retrieval after next week. And then we have the last module in the following week there after, right? That was my thinking. I've, I've noticed that, uh, so the way this, when we have the, the normal, the regular mode of instruction, the way this is done is we have one, one lecture every week, right? And seminars. And the idea behind this is if you look at the things we're talking about, for instance, right now, in fact, even the other modules, we're talking about different things that are, in fact, courses in their own right, right? So I, I think, to be fair, maybe you probably need a bit of time to digest, um, digest the information. And then, yeah, so maybe we should continue next, I mean, tomorrow, I suppose. Uh, unless if people have any objection to that or something. I think that's fine with me. I want to find out if you know the exact dates for the exam, since you said you are... No, actually, I, I don't know the exact date, which is why I was asking if Dr. Kandwa reached out to you. If he hasn't, then maybe it would be prudent for the, uh, the class rep to just uh, shoot him a, a short note to say, uh, Lighton mentioned that uh, the exams are not taking place in August, but likely in September or October. Could you please tell us the actual date. And in fact, what I was planning to do is to be somewhat fair. Uh, 
instead of having the test in the week of the third, maybe we can have it in the, in the following week, which is the week of the 10th of August, at least, to have people, give people a chance to, to read up and, uh, you know, don't know. Yeah, so I, I, don't know the, I don't know the exact date, but maybe reach out to Dr. Candelo uh, to just mention that Lighton said uh, the, the exams are not taking place in August. Is, what is the actual date? I'm sure you'll be able to respond to that. Okay, and the assignments that Dr. Piri gave us, I no. think grading hasn't been done unless others have received. We did too. Oh, he hasn't. How many assignments are there, by the way? We did. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. This is this is the thing. Uh, I will find out from him. I thought I'll find he, out he had told me he was. I'll try and see if he would need help marking. In which case, I can try and help with the marking. Uh, but uh, I'll give him a reminder so that he marks uh, the assignment. Yeah. But but uh, I, I'm certain. I'm fairly certain that you should be able to get uh, results of the assessments before the exam. That's normally the policy. Anyway, you wouldn't write the exam without knowing your your assess or your CA rather. So I'll follow up with Dr. Piri on that. Yes. Okay. On, on the Dr. Akas issue, I did talk yes. to him. He was saying that uh, he's, uh, he's still waiting for the response from the IDE, from uh, Dr. Simui uh, to write officially. That's when he will communicate to all of us concerning the status score of whether we are writing, but he indicated that we are not going to write this uh, August. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and I mean, I, I can yeah. speak to that. I can vouch for the fact that uh, the exam is not in, in August. That I know because, in fact, he, he sent her a message not, not so long ago, actually. Uh, is, or was I dreaming or something? I, I, don't, I don't know, but I think he sent, he sent out a message. What is that thing? What, what have I done? He sent out a message. Uh, wow. Send out a message, I think. Anyway, yeah. So, but maybe write to write to him. Uh, the cluster can reach out to find out. Sometimes, you know, he might forget. But sending a reminder, formal reminder, to say we want to find out or something. Uh, we want to find out the details. It will force him to to actually. Uh... Oh, there we go. So this is what I was talking about here. Uh, so. I don't know if you can see this, right? This is the message. Now, this is highly unusual, but the message came through WhatsApp, right? Uh, <laughs> so I couldn't forward it. Normally, I forward these messages, but oh, maybe I should have forwarded it using WhatsApp or something. So, uh, so anyway, so this I know, right? So it's it's not August, so it's either September, or October. But I I also spoke to Dr. Smui not too long ago, some two days ago, and he said October. So, but but obviously, you want official official like. Uh, an official message so that you you know the exact date or something. So I I think we should the class trip should reach out to Dr. Kandela just so you can push if there is no date yet. Are there any other uh, concerns or comments? Is this making sense by the way so far the interaction or I don't know or is this gibberish or something? So far this is the third interaction I think. Is well, I yeah, it 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 has added context to to the notes, so it's um it's making sense. It's helpful. Yeah, whenever someone begins with a yeah, you you, you become a bit skeptical. Okay, I'm glad it's uh even if there's a there's a bit of yeah there, but uh, it's making ignore the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, yeah, are fine. Yeah. Okay. Um. Right. Any other issues though? Uh. Now I'm oh also I'm trying to see right. At some stage, we're supposed to have a practical. Maybe on Sunday, what I'm suggesting, because tomorrow I think we might finish the theory. Instead of me walking you through the, the screenshots, I think it would be boring. What we'll do is we'll try an online kind of practical session. So I do encourage you to please, Sunday, make sure that um, you have at least a laptop or something, so that we, we actually, we all log in and do the practice and then my role would be to walk you through what to do uh, and to explain like uh, any issues that you might have. I think it would, it would make for an interesting interaction if we go that that route. Instead of what I was planning to do is this, right? Where I'm walking you through the screencast, say this is what's happening here, this is what's happening here. 
but it makes no sense doing that, right? So what I'm thinking we do is we'll have a practical session. It will be online. Uh, so I'll be on hand to try and help out where people need help. So just make sure that you have um, a laptop that you can easily work with on Sunday. Sadly, uh, normally these practical sessions will typically involve a component where we also install this space, but we won't be able to install this space. Instead, we shall use um, a demo instance, right? And I'll explain more about, about this. Uh, we use uh, a demo instance. Um, this demo instance, that it's, it's nice for practice sessions. Uh, all right. Uh, unless if there are any other questions, I suppose. Or concerns, uh, things that you think I can help with or something, I don't know. Um, thinking out what would be here, but nothing. The, the test is going to include everything that was covered with Dr. Piri and what we're covering together. So uh, I, I hope uh, I hope we're up to speed with that part. Uh, if if perhaps there's perhaps basics of what was covered yes, that you think we might need to uh, to just revisit briefly, like a quick walkthrough, you can always do that once we are done with module eight seeing as we have a bit of additional time. So something to think about if you don't have a response right now, but you can think about this and then we can have a chat tomorrow or something. Doc. Yes, yes. Is it in order to ask how many questions we are going to have? Yeah, well, I don't know yet, but it is in order. What I can do though is, uh, I don't know if, it, was this not uploaded onto the thing? What I can do is I can easily, I can easily do this. Um, it's not that hard, the question is the way. Now, granted, this is there's a bit of, um, take this with a bit of a, a grain of salt because Dr. Piri will have, will set questions associated with his uh, component, right, the component he handled. But I wanted to point out that in my case, I can share with you these things here, both the exam from last year and the other year, so that you have an idea of how the, the test and normally, now it's, granted this is going to be slightly different because it's an online test obviously, but uh, what you should expect is uh, uh, things similar to what you find in these things here, right? So if this is not there, I'll upload this on, do you have, do you, do you have samples of the exams and the uh, tests from last uh, year and the other year or something? Uh, just for last year. Okay, yeah, so what I can do is I can also make available stuff from 2018 as well, both the exam and uh, the, test. The, exam and, uh, and the test so that you have an idea of what to expect. So the, the parts, for instance, questions that, um, what do you call this? Questions for the parts that I handled will be phrased similar to what you'll find in the exams and the test from last year, essentially. It shouldn't be. Will our find uh, be online or? You have to write on campus. Unfortunately, we'll have to, no. Fortunately, to be online, right? And I'm saying fortunately here because it's practically an open book exam now, is it? <laughs> which is uh, which is fine, I guess. Uh, now, if I were you, to be timed. Usually, these assessments are timed, right? But it's online. Um, you want to make sure that you read up and not rely on on looking up information, you waste time. I remember the experience I had when I was a graduate student. Literally all the exams I was writing were so-called take-home exams, 24 hours, right? So I have 24 hours to write an exam. And the first take-home exam I wrote, I regretted what I did. Hmm. I stayed, I did not sleep, right? I took it for granted that uh, because it was a take-home exam, I would be writing it the comfort of my room, you know, go to the kitchen and drink coffee if I wanted to. I stayed up. I stayed up the whole night, right? Literally panicking all the way up to when it was, it was time to submit the test. I remember the test was supposed to be submitted at, was that nine hours or 10 hours? And I was, I was going there somewhere around 9.45 or 9.50, right? Wow. So, um, so it would be online, but you just want to make sure that you, 
you may be properly prepared, even though it will be like an open, it's actually going to be an open book test, really, if you think about it. If it's online, it's an open book text because, test because, or assessment, because you, you, you'll be able to look up information if you want to. And so with that being said, right, because you'll be able to look up information, the phrasing will be probably different from the, the way the questions were phrased in like an in-classroom in, in classroom, um, assessment. I don't know if that makes sense. Yes, it does. Yeah. Uh, and also the unfortunate thing about tests usually is that uh, unlike the exam where typically you are given, uh, like if you look at past, past exams, like in this case, the 2018 one, five questions and you choose three, you have an hour for each of the three questions. For the test, usually it's all questions are mandatory. So unlike the exam where you have the option to choose which question, all questions are mandatory. I guess the consolation for this test is that even if it's, if it's mandatory, it's likely there's going to be a question from all the different modules, right? And it's also likely that the questions are going to be phrased in such a way that one question will probably have a component to do with HTML and databases, and maybe there'll be a bit of digital libraries in there as well, so even information in So just something to keep at the back of our minds, I suppose, I don't know. I hope that answers your question about, uh, in terms of the number of questions, I would have to first of all ask Dr. Piri. Uh, it would depend on how, how much content you want to include in his part of the module. Uh, because I'm only handling seven, six, seven, and eight. Uh, he handled most of that. So it would depend on how much content you want to include there. Yeah, I think it's clear. Okay. Uh, any, uh, any, any other questions? Okay, uh, my other hope is, I mentioned this again, but uh, it's, it's my hope that uh, by the time we're done with this, some of you would take a keen interest in wanting to implement some of these things we're talking about at work. Uh, I'm more than happy to help wherever you need it. If you need, uh, if you need help, right, setting up the repository, um, if you need me to interact with uh, IT, for, we, we've done this with Zikas actually. Uh, it? it counts towards what uh, is called community service for me. So I'm expected to provide certain services for free. It counts oh. towards community service. I just put it on my CV and I get points for that. So uh, take advantage of this. If you need help uh, implementing a repository and you think I can help, and also, I've been doing this with Abel and Zachary because they're also getting points. So uh, if you have, if you notice some aspects of what Abel is going to talk about, especially to do with copyright and, and IP uh, or open access, um, and you need help, uh, we would all more, more than happy to help. Um, we want, those of you especially working for these higher education institutions, we want to see your institution on the, um, <clears throat> on the, Zambia National ETD portal, right? That's one of the goals. And this, this, it's been a goal of ours for, I think this is year number two or something, if not year number three. So we, we are thinking of launching this thing very, very soon, right? This thing very, very soon. And so it, it helps if we have, uh, you know, if we can co-opt colleagues from other institutions to be a part of this. Uh, unless if there are any other questions, I guess we'll have to part ways. Any last remarks or questions you want me to attend to? No. All right. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow then. Thanks a lot. And uh, good night. Uh, I will share this thing as soon as it finishes rendering the recording so that you have a chance to play it back if you want to. Uh, good night. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Good night, people. Good night. See you tomorrow. Good night. Good night. Good night.